Okay. Um, I will uh, start my presentation by sharing my screen. Pedro, please let me know if you can um, see my presentation. Okay. Yes, we are all seeing. Okay. Um, now we are seeing a beautiful landscape. Now it's yeah. correct. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, hi everyone again. Um, I will just close my video cam because of the internet internet connection. Um, okay, so um, so my name is Rodrigo. Um, I'm a PhD student um, at University of São Paulo and King's College of London. And then uh, today I'm presenting a chapter of what's going to be my PhD thesis and um, hopefully a published paper. Uh, let's see. Um, so. Um, so yeah, so Petrobras has always uh, been part of my daily life uh, because you know uh, my father was a, a Petrobras employee for almost 30 years. So I have been exposed to talks about oil and gas and their importance to Brazil's economy. And then, uh, so I, um, it has uh, incentivized me to focus my academic pursuits on this subject. So um, you can imagine how impacted I was when the Brazilian press was uh, reporting suspicious deals between Petrobras and political parties in 2013, 2014. And I remember that um, The Economist uh, magazine called it as the biggest corruption scandal in the world's history. Um, and as you know, the corruption scandal involved Petrobras, uh, involved Petrobras, political parties, and construction enterprise, which explains why um, there has been this discussion among the Brazilian society now on whether Petrobras should be privatized or not. So we have this um, uh, current Brazilian minister, such as Adolfo Sachicido, which is the current uh, Brazil's minister of energy, uh, arguing that Petrobras privatization would prevent further corruption from happening again. Um, while others advocate the idea that company that this company has a crucial role in promoting the local industry, uh, culture and scientific support to the Brazilian state, and um, some authors are uh, promoting Brazilian foreign policy. Um, so um, the literature shows that connections between Brazil's state bureaucracy and Petrobras depend on the state strategy in force. Uh, for instance, um, during President Cardoso's administration, uh, energy self-sufficient was the leading state's goal. So the exploration investment uh, program became Petrobras priority. But you know, after the pre-salt offshore oil discoveries, uh, Petrobras kind of adapted its strategy to, um, to Lula's administration, uh, which was characterized by the promotion of refining, biofuels, and the attempt to revitalize local industry. This is what, um, the literature says. Um, however, however um, while investments in refining remained high uh, uh, through Lula's government, upstream investment was reduced, which uh, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that international investments have never been the most profitable area in Petrobras. And even so, during Lula's administration, this area had a boost in investments, um, as we can see in this graph. So some authors argue that the national objectives um, were more important than commercial concerns um, uh, during Lula's administration regarding Petrobras. So, um, so this was um, my, um, my justification for this research, basically. And then, um, so my database was, ba was um, based mostly on diplomatic cables. Um, uh, this is how a diplomat cable looks like for those who are not um, familiar with. So um, I've been researching diplomat cables since uh, at least uh, 2016 for my master's thesis. And then uh, what's new here is that for my PhD, for this research, for this paper that I'm presenting, um, I, I just decided to do a, quantita a quantitative text analysis, um, and I will, which I will explain uh, in the next slide. But anyway, so my database was, uh, I collected all the diplomat cables from 1994 uh, to 2017 at the Marachi. Uh, I also collected diplomatic cables from the Department of State through WikiLeaks uh, website. And then I crossed the information uh, with Petrobras reports and the reports um, with Operation Car Wash testimonials 
So this is uh, my, my databases. Um, and then uh, this graph is the result of my quantitative text analysis based on diplomatic cables. So um, I like the idea of uh, doing process tracing based on empirical evidence. Um, so I use the Python language uh, to generate these results. Uh, my, uh, well, my aim was to um, count the number of Petrobras mentions in Brazilian diplomatic cables per year. So I could focus my uh, process tracing in a more accurate way. Um, and you can note that um, the number of Petrobras mentions in Brazilian diplomatic cables uh, increased between 2008 and 2012. So, um, so this is my research design. Um, what explains Petrobras decision-making process uh, regarding the company's international contracts between 2003 and 2015. And why 2003 and 2015? Because I thought it would be um, a good idea to uh, analyze all the PT's administration since the dimensions uh, to Petrobras increased during PT's administration. So I thought it would be a good idea. And then, um, uh, and based on content analysis of these diplomatic cables between 2008 and 2012, um, I found that the most important, the most seated international contract uh, in this period was the construction of Abreu Lima refinery and the purchase of the Ipiranga group. So these were my uh, case studies. Uh, besides, uh, they were also the biggest Petrobras international contracts in this period. Um, so I will explain my hypothesis in the next slides. So, um, so there is a huge link to um, a state-owned uh, enterprise, not only all, about oil companies, but state-owned enterprise as a whole. Um, so some authors are that the, the strong ties between Petrobras, in the case of Brazil, and the Brazilian government. Uh, prevent the company from seeking financial profitability. And uh, many authors have addressed the relationship between political parties and the executive branch. Um, and then, well, in the case of Petrobras, based on the TCU reports, political parties have acted in, rate, in a rainty seeking behavior. So they intend to influence companies' highest decision-making board, the board of directors, uh, to make uh, investment decisions that could result in more bribe opportunities, which is my main um, hypothesis in this research. And uh, which is interesting is that uh, based on the um, Operation Car Wash testimonials, um, Petrobras directors prefer, prefer it to follow the guidelines of politicians to get promotions or to keep their positions within Petrobras board of directors instead of following technical and uh, uh, let's say market uh, interests. Um, so, um, but we, we will talk about this later. So uh, anyway, there is uh, this evidence of association between favoritism and allocating public contracts. So the literature, uh, because it's difficult to separate technical decisions from political decisions, what the literature do, does is uh, basically um, analyzing the, uh, the, the highest decision-making board, which in the case of Petrobras is the board of directors. So this is uh, what I did in this research, uh, because the board of direction is, is um, appointed by pre the president and uh, which follow political parties' uh, interests. So we can say that the highest decision-making uh, board of Petrobras is political motivated. Um, so this is my main argument. Um, the second argument is about foreign policy. Um, so there are a lot of um, a lot of Brazilian authors, especially that say that Petrobras has been used uh, that the Brazilian government has been uh, has used Petrobras as a geopolitical instrument. Uh, so, in other words, Petrobras' decision-making process is constrained by Brazilian foreign policy goals. Um, so, I I intended to test this hypothesis about how important it is foreign policy uh, and if foreign policy explains Petrobras decision-making uh, process regarding international contracts. And finally, my third hypothesis is that profit and market interest explains 
Petrobras decision making process. And this is actually uh, based on my master's thesis, because um, my master's thesis was about the role of Petrobras in Brazil Nigeria relations. And back then, um, I found that there was no synergy between the company and the Brazilian embassy in Nigeria. So I interviewed the, um, the former Brazilian ambassador in Nigeria, Ana Candida Perez, uh, who told me that there was just informal meetings and um, between Petrobras and the embassy. And then I did a research on secret diplomatic cables at Itamaraty. And indeed, there was no foreign policy strategy going on in Nigeria, despite uh, Nigeria being Brazil's largest uh, trade partner in Africa. So my main conclusions uh, in this paper is that um, Petrobras indeed has become a subject of foreign policy in diplomatic cables between 2008 and 2012 because of um, significant investments taking place in partnership with Venezuela's PDVSA in that period. However, uh, Petrobras was not an instrument, was not a foreign policy tool uh, to the Brazilian government. Uh, for, um, Itamaraty has just a secondary role. And then um, and par instead, part patronage, uh, political parties explain Brazil's, uh, sorry, Petrobras decision-making process. So not, uh, neither the politicians nor the Petrobras directors were acted in the company's decision-making process um, um, following any pol foreign policy guidelines. And then um, by analyzing the uh, report meetings of Petrobras and also the TCU reports, uh, I found that not, um, you know, uh, foreign policy, Itamaraty, they were not even mentioned uh, in the meetings of Petrobras board of directors. Um, and it, actually, in most decisions taken by Petrobras board of directors, uh, directors, not even commercial criteria, not even technical criteria was were uh, uh, discussed. So um, foreign policy is not really a matter of concern. Um, and then there is no also there is no evidence that uh, the ministry Brazilian Brazil's Ministry of Energy or uh, you know, like I said, Itamaraty or any other government sector influenced Petrobras decisions, um, but political parties' interests. Um, so basically, uh, to sum up, my findings are opposed to most of uh, the literature on Petrobras and foreign policy that advocates that Petrobras is a foreign policy asset and it's a geopolitical instrument. Um, I found uh, no synergy between the company and Itamaraty, not even when Petrobras was most mentioned in diplomatic cables. And then, uh, and it was worth mentioning that I have researched secret diplomatic cables for the past um, five years uh, in Brazil, London, and Paris. And uh, I have found that strong connections between foreign policy goals and international oil companies. Uh, but this is not the case in Brazil. Uh, political party interests explain Petrobras decision-making process, and there is no broad strategy uh, that we could call like uh, oil diplomacy or petro diplomacy in Brazil. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pedro, and thank you all for your time. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. It was a very interesting presentation as well. And now we will have the comments of Professor Guilherme Casarões. And I would just like to highlight that the chat is free for all of you to make some questions. Please, Professor Guilherme Casarões, thank you for your time. Pedro, thank you so much for uh, organizing this event. It, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to all of my friends and colleagues who are uh, present here today. Uh, Rodrigo, uh, I really enjoyed reading your paper. Um, I think it's a, it's a major contribution to the literature, not only on foreign policy studies, but also on Brazil's contemporary politics. Because ultimately, that's, that's not properly a, a foreign policy uh, analysis. That's more like a uh, the, the relationship between the state-owned enterprises, as you've, uh, as you've proposed, and the Brazilian government. And of course, it has foreign policy implications, but the core of what you're suggesting is um, Petrobras has been used as the bulwark, as the center of a method of governance 
under the Workers' Party rule, right? If if that's if if I understood it correctly, that's that's your your main uh, conclusion, right? It's not a, an assumption because you hypothesize it and you treat uh, three hypotheses uh, in parallel. But I think that the ma main contribution that you bring to us is precisely to show the details with so many documents and so many uh, so many primary sources of how the Workers' Party has used the, 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 the Petrobras structure uh, as part of its uh, pork barreling strategy, as part of its uh, patronage uh, logic, right? Um, and you know, uh, having followed Brazilian politics for the last, uh, I don't know, 10 years, um, it sounds a little bit obvious at first. I mean, uh, th th that's how the narrative has gone. If you if you think about how the way the way we have constructed the story about Petrobras and the Workers Party and Petrolão and all, but I think that the the main contribution of your work is precisely to give a lot of empirical substance to something that belongs or that uh, erstwhile belonged to the camp of narratives, right? So now you're 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 pretty much showing us. Uh, two very important things, and I really appreciate your work for that. The first thing is the, the, the strategy of Petrobras under the Workers' Party has primarily been attached to the interest of political parties uh, that were part of the uh, of Lula's majority coalition. So, so that, that's the first thing. And I, um, even though, again, uh, that's not really new, the way you have constructed your argument is indeed very uh, rigorous. So uh, that's the first thing. And, and the second thing that you show us, and I also think it's important as a contribution to the literature on foreign policy analysis is, uh, the way Brazil has used Petrobras has little to no connection to the broader uh, foreign policy strategy. And it really came to me as a shock to see, to, to see the documents that you, <laughs> that you bring over. Um, that, for example, uh, it was a, a very difficult conversation between PDVSA and, and Petrobras and the Brazilian government. I mean, uh, we, we once assumed back in the day that Brazil and Venezuela were hand in hand on that. And what you show us is that um, Brazil was acting uh, all on its own, all by itself. It didn't really care about Venezuela's interests. Um, which goes against what we have, what we might have assumed in the past. So I think that uh, these two contributions are really powerful contributions. The first one to, 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 to prove empirically that party uh, patronage has directed Petrobras's decisions over the last, I don't know, 20 years. Um, I, I'd love to see an analysis going back into the 1980s, for example, to see if the logic also applies to previous governments. I, I assume it does, even though um, I don't see Petrobras as a key a piece of the governance puzzle for either Fernando Henrique or Collor or anyone who came before them. Um, I, I, I'd love to see an expansion, a further elaboration of this discussion, uh, looking at uh, the, the specific aspect of uh, governing capacity, or as we call it in Portuguese, governabilidade of the Workers' Party administrations, to, to, to show that Petrobras was uh, probably the, 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 the silver lining that connected every single political party and uh, interests of th these parties. Uh, one of the things, if I understood your, your point correctly, one of the things that you reveal is that not everything that had to do with Petrobras under the Workers' Party was about corruption. And, and, and this is another very important thing. I mean, corruption was one part of the story, but pork barreling in general uh, is also uh, an important part of the story. And it's, I think it's crucial for us not to narrow uh, the Workers' Party in office period down to corruption scandals. Pork barreling is part of the democratic game. And it's fine to use uh, all means available to governments to uh, 
uh, to make sure that uh, the alliance is held together or the, the coalition is strong. Uh, but but what, what you've uh, shown us is that on behalf of Port Berling or on behalf of some corruption uh, uh, focus here and there, uh, Petrobras, the decisions of Petrobras went against pretty much every single market logic and even foreign policy logic along the way. So th th this is uh, th this is what I, I think should be the 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 core of your argument. Your your contribution to the literature goes in in in, in this direction. But of course, I think that you also bring a, a very powerful foreign policy contribution, showing something that oh, I, I've written about it before. I know that Pedro has also written about it. Uh, Luis has probably written about it too. I, I think that we are we are very slowly debunking the myth that the Workers' Party foreign policy was all about the ideological partners. Brazil has acted much more selfishly <laughs> when it came to its foreign policy strategy in the region than in, in tandem with uh, ideological partners. So somehow, even if you don't say it explicitly, I mean, you, you show elements that point towards this direction, but you don't state this explicitly. But I really believe, and even more so after reading your paper, that Brazil was never ideologically aligned with Venezuela beyond the narrative, beyond the, 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 the bilateral speeches, beyond Lula's trips to Caracas. You see, uh, most of what the Brazilian government did, and Petrobras in particular, was, was purely a method of holding the government together. It was a matter of political survival at home, <laughs> not really a matter of uh, international projection abroad. Right, and um, and, and, and this also uh, begs the question: Well, what kind of strategy did Brazil really have towards the region? Because we assume it was cooperative, we assume it was uh, constructive, we assume it was, uh, you know, based on liberal integrationist principles. And that's not, not exactly what we see from your paper. So I, I think that um, if, even though, I, I'm not sure, is this, your, is this part of, a period of your PhD dissertation? Right, so um, I, I would love to see this published, of course, uh, because I think it, it makes a, a powerful contribution to the literature. But I think you can unfold this discussion into two very different yet overlapping papers. One paper to show Petrobras as a means of governability in Brazilian politics under the Workers' Party rule, right? And, and this is something that I don't think people have discussed uh, so deeply so far, because we, we talk a lot about corruption, but what you're showing is different. What you're showing is a state-owned enterprise lied at the heart of PT's strategy of governing the country. So that's uh, one thing. And the other thing is, I'd love to see a reflection, maybe a paper, uh, maybe a full-fledged paper on uh, the, the, the true logic behind Brazil's relations, uh, Brazil's, let's put it, oil, oil diplomacy, right? That's the, the expression that we use. That's the expression that you bring on your paper. I, I'd love to see Brazil's oil diplomacy uh, being deconstructed as a concept of foreign policy, because that's not exactly what we saw uh, under uh, the rule of the Workers' Party. And I do think, just a final comment, I do think that uh, your, your findings pretty much match what we have found in our paper on, on Lula's foreign policy, because a part of our explanation as to the overexpansion hypothesis has to do with the parties and dynamics at home. Of course, that, that, that's not the, the only thing we argue. I think it has to do with diplomatic beliefs and traditions and whatnot. But um, I think that one of the innovations of this recent body of literature on foreign policy analysis uh, 
is to reveal the nuts and bolts of the domestic international nexus or domestic foreign policy nexus. This is not something that people often do, especially when it comes to, foreign, to Brazilian foreign policy analysis, because we, we very often assume that Itamarachi plays the, 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 plays the cards and deals the cards. So I, I think that what you're showing is uh, there's more to, uh, to, to, to foreign policy in the strategy of parties like PMDB or PP or PF or PTB than we would like to assume at first. So these countries, they care about foreign policy, but in a very different logic, right? And this is something that you might, um, I mean, that, that, that you end up showing by your paper. So I, I really liked reading your paper because I think you, you give us this two-pronged contribution. So it's not just one. You should be happy because you have two uh, pretty much uh, full-fledged articles to, to, to publish after your PhD is done. And I hope you do, because I think you, you, you owe this uh, huge contribution to the literature at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Guilherme. We have also a very interesting comment of Professor Sean Burgess that I will share with you. But I will ask for you, Rodrigo, to answer that later on for us not to be very late with this schedule. But I will read the comment that will be very, very useful as well as Guilherme comments for your PhD research. So Professor Sean Burgess says, have you looked at the Petrobras investments in Angola? I could not get a good explanation for the Petrobras presence in Angola when I was talking to people in Luanda. Most observers seem confused that Petrobras had bought oil block concessions in areas where the other majors were dubious that there was oil. What seemed to be happening most with Petrobras in Angola was commercial trade facilitation of one type of oil for another, almost as a way to facilitate the flow of the Empreiteira FDI and what BNDS funding that was flowing, loans being repaid with oil trade to Petrobras. So please, Rodrigo, take a note of this very good comment. And we will uh, later on go back to, to, to the topic. Thank you very much, Professor Sean Burgess. And we will follow our program. Now we'll have the presentation of Lucas Amorim from the International Relations Institute with the Brazil's new investment treaty model, why now? And then we will have comments from Professor Luis Estemoni. Please, Lucas, you have the floor. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> um, please let me know if you, uh, if my audio has any issues or anything like that. Um, I'm going to share my presentation with you. Just a second. So, first of all, I'd like I'm I'm like to I'd like to say I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here, and that I'm humbled by the company I have in, in today's seminar. Uh, my name is Lucas Amorim. I'm a PhD student here at the Institute of International Relations at USP. And this paper is the result is, uh, and this presentation is the result of a paper that is about to be published. It was written with my former advisor, Professor Enrique Menezes from the Federal University of Paraíba. Okay. Yes, first of all, I'd like to, to make it clear that this paper uh, wasn't born as specifically as a foreign policy. Uh, a paper, it was thought of as a political economy paper. So my main inspiration was this book by Professor Laura Carvalho, Valsa Brasileira do Caos, do Bom ao Caos Econômico. She's a professor at USP at the School of Economics and, and Administration. So what she does in her book is to describe uh, the Brazilian government Macroeconomic policy during the administrations of President Lula da Silva and President Dilma Rousseff. They were both presidents from the Workers' Party, 
And this book is a collection of, of articles that she wrote for the uh, Folha de São Paulo newspaper, which is a, a major news outlet here in Brazil. So became a bestseller uh, here. And I read this paper during my, my economic policy class at my political economy classes in João Pessoa. And I started thinking about the Brazilian macroeconomic changes in the 2000s and 2010s. Yes. Basically, I'm going to summarize the argument of the book just so you understand what, why I, 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 I got, how I got here. So she describes two broad periods of the Brazilian conduct of economic policy. Milagrinho from 2006 to 2010. This period is uh, described as broadly as a period of economic prosperity with the commodity prices boom, um, development uh, policies based on the expansion of consumption, redistributive social policies such as Bolsa Família and other welfare programs. But uh, with this strong orthodox uh, economic view based on the enactment of fiscal responsibility rules, uh, the enactment of inflation targets by the Ministry of Finance that had to be followed by the central bank in, in a more or less independent way and floating exchange rates, okay? Contrasting with this first period of the conduct of economic policy, we have what she calls as Agenda Fiesp. Fiesp is the Federation of Industries of the state of Sao Paulo, which is the most industrialized state um, in Brazil. It's called that because the author attributes uh, to this organization uh, a proposal for that aimed at reindustrializing the Brazilian economy. So there was a, this agenda with uh, industrial productivity uh, agenda with tax exemptions for industrial sector monetary easing, uh, lowering of interest rates that some economic economists describe as artificial, whatever uh, that means, and the devaluation of the Brazilian health, okay? So my idea was, uh, there was this very, uh, this period of very deep influence of interest groups in the economic policy of the Brazilian government. So does this influence also encompass economic foreign policy? Um, let me see if I'm controlling my time right. We are already behind schedule. Uh, so the case chosen uh, was the ACFI program. ACFI is an acronym for the Cooperation and Facilitation Investment Agreement. This is a, a model of investment treaty that was formulated by Brazil and as an alternative to the mainstream investment treaties that are widely adopted by other countries. Um, the main characteristics of this, of this treaty is that having in mind that investment treaties have become increasingly uh, polemic in, in the next, in the recent past, um, the most polemic clauses of the treaties have been uh, excluded. Yeah, for example, there is the indirect expropriation clause, which prohibits the countries that signed the treaty from uh, taking measures that may be tantamount to expropriation, even though they don't directly take. Uh, the investment from the investor. The minimum standard of protection, which is a very um, broad protection of investments, of foreign investments, that include, for example, a provision that investors should be treated in a fair and equitable way. And I think more importantly, uh, about enforcement, right? Uh, investor state arbitration, which is widely known by the acronym ISDS or Investor State Dispute Settlement uh, is not included in the treaty. So 
the model does not include the consent of the, the states, the parties involved in the treaty to investor state arbitration procedures, okay? The Brazilian government describes this treaty model as having a focus on dispute prevention, rather on dispute settlement and on promoting investment promotion uh, discussions between the countries involved. Uh, this is not the first interaction Brazil had with the investment uh, treaty regime. So previously in the 90s, Brazil had signed treaties uh, with a relatively uh, broad array of countries but mostly developed uh, economies okay, from this list, only Chile, Cuba, and, and Venezuela are, are developing economies. Uh, most of other partners are, are developed countries. Um, <clears throat> and this first wave of treaties was given in a very different uh, economic context, okay? So previously, uh, Brazil, such as other Latin American countries, had offered great resistance to, to the investment treaty regime. This resistance was only broken uh, after the 80s when, macro, uh, when global economic conditions changed, especially uh, uh, some authors attributed specifically to this, what we call the Volcker shock, the steep rise in Fed interest rates, that made prohibitively expensive for, for Latin American countries to keep financing their development policies through, through, through loans uh, in the international market. Uh, from 1982, many Latin American countries de uh, defaulted in their debt obligations, starting with Mexico. And after this period, uh, we can see uh, uh, the adoption of neoliberal policies based on the Washington consensus being adopted in the region, yeah? And the Washington consensus includes a topic on FDI liberalization and protection. So given in context of, of uh, bounded rationality, Latin American countries have very little, um, very little information available at the time. They didn't have uh, arbitral awards published uh, in this period. Many signed them without uh, knowing to the full extent what uh, the consequences of signing these treaties would be, okay? Um, more recently, uh, what I call a second wave of investment treaties happened after 2015. Uh, as you can see in the table, the profile of, of treaty partners it's very different, uh, mostly developing economies. Uh, sorry, Lucas, but we cannot see your slide, just the first one. Okay. Then. Is it, is it like frozen in a specific slide yes. or you don't see it at all? It's frozen on the first one. Yeah, let me turn off my camera so. And please let me know if the issue is correct. If you if you can conclude in within five minutes, I would appreciate it. Thank yeah, I'm I'm already. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to finish. Um, okay, so the late 2010s, when the second wave of investment treaties. Uh, happened um, is a very different economic and political context. Uh, context. So Latin American countries already had in, uh, uh, information available about what was the consequence of signing these treaties with arbitral awards being published in the late 90s and 2000s. And the focus of, uh, of literature written about investment treaties recently has been mostly of criticism of this tool of promoting FDI flows. Um, while in the 1980s and 1990s, we saw a very difficult scenario for countries, uh, for developing countries to finance their economies through loans, uh, 
at the time of a very lax monetary policy in the global north, uh, credit was cheap, yeah? And in this period, uh, the global south, well, developing economies or uh, net importers of capital, uh, the global south received almost 50% of global capital flows, which was a very different scenario again. So we broadly characterize this period of, as having no ideational or economic stimuli to adopt of investment treaties if you see them as a tool of uh, increasing FDI inflows. Now, um, we also see a global configuration of FDI flows changing recently. So you have to, to have that in mind and that in this period investment treaties for Brazil were not only a tool of attracting FDI, but maybe starting uh, an answer to worries about Brazilian uh, internationalization of, of Brazilian companies, okay? So for example, you can see the changing profile of uh, investment outflows while in 2001, 93% of FDI outflows had as origin countries in the global north. This has changed. In 2018, you had almost 50-50 uh, uh, distribution. Uh, Brazilian direct investment stocks abroad at this time reached an, an impressive 381 billion US dollars. And you can see the importance of these uh, of these investment stock. If you notice, notice that in the African mining sector, Brazil was responsible for 30% of FDI. Yes, uh, I think our main contribution is, uh, is highlighting the, the importance of lobby groups in the adoption of this uh, institutional solution. Yeah, reports from both CNE, which is the National Confederation of Industries, and FIESP precedes the reform uh, proposal by Brazil. And the uh, Brazilian documents in multilateral forums uh, reaffirm that the private sector's role was uh, a very important uh, element for the Brazilian government in conducting the ACFI program. Okay, so I have a very short conclusions. Uh, we can notice the destabilization of the North-South character of the investment treaty regime. Previously, developed and developing economies had very clear roles in, in the treaty regime, in the investment treaty regime, as, uh, and this, it, this has been changing. It, it has been changing recently, especially for Brazil, yeah. Um, the SC, uh, the the treaty model Brazil implemented recently, both answers to the demand for institutional solutions to the ISDS legitimacy crisis and uh, the Brazilian private sector that is eager for protection uh, for, at the time, right, uh, increasingly internationalized operations. And therefore, the ACFI program was formulated under a period of strong influence from the industrial lobby not only in the conduct of macroeconomic policy, but also in the, like what we could call foreign economic policy. Okay. Uh, beyond what I have in the paper, we can notice that many of the treaties remain unratified. There is a mixed success in promoting the new treaty abroad. Other BRICS countries did not sign ACFIs with Brazil, only India, which I think is the most important ACFI uh, a partner with Brazil. We have no presence in regions with great dynamic, uh, with, uh, with a great economic dynamic such as Southeast Asia. So while well, uh, locating my paper within the, the, the topic of this seminar, maybe this is another indication of Brazil's overextension in its uh, foreign policy. Okay. I have here a few other papers I'm, I, I'm working on at the moment. So I have another paper specifically on Latin Americans relationship with the investment treaty regime. And in this year's uh, Brazilian International Relations Association seminar, I'll be presenting 
a paper on the roles of interest groups in the formulation of US investment policy. So all comments are welcome. If you need to reach me, you can find me, if this is my email address, feel free to send me a message. I think that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lucas. Unfortunately, we could not see the, the slide. So I will suggest to you to send your email in the chat. Okay. And also to attach your article that's a published article as well into the chat. So for those who want to see the, the, the graphs, the table, the results, it's available. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So now we pass the word for brief comments to Professor Luis Scanoni. Please, Professor. Uh, thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Lucas. I thoroughly enjoyed this paper. Um, I think the presentation, unfortunately, because of the slides and whatnot, didn't really do justice to a very nice article, which, as Pedro said, was already at least forthcoming. So I, I read basically the proofs. Um, so congratulations on that. I so to, to summarize the way I understood the the argument, you're basically proposing that this this very interesting empirical puzzle that. Uh, Brazil entered in full in a strategy of engaging with, with investment treaties uh, and, and multiplying or increasing the number of bilateral investment, investment treaties. Um, it was part of in a context where uh, basically all of what we would say from the international political economy literature are incentives to participate of these treaties are either attracting foreign investment or um, a context of, say, international pressure to participate of these treaties or diffusion, right? Thinking of Elkins and Simmons, right? You, you can either engage this, this uh, institutions because of the context of competition, in this case for capital, or because of the context uh, of, of diffusion of this kind of treaty as well. None of this was present in the, in the 2010s, and, and nonetheless, Brazil pursues this strategy. Um, and then you try to explain a bit like the, the, the Brazilian anomaly or that at least that's how the paper is framed. I, I think that this, this kind of framing is very usual uh, in, the, in the Brazilian foreign policy analysis or the, um, literature uh, and that narrows your contribution down to explain the idiosyncrasies of why Brazil did it. In a way, right, which limits a lot what you can say about um, about this, right? So, I would I would suggest another this this are frames that sort of appear here and there in your in your work, but that would make the case much more interesting, which would be to 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 ask how can subaltern states like Brazil or states that are not clearly OECD countries or countries that have been you know uh, spare heading these efforts to, to increase this the number of treaties of this sort. How can then uh, introduce changes in the international regime, right? Uh, that like these CFIA treaties that you that you bring to the table, uh, kind of introduce new clauses that uh, leverage uh, basically you know, level the game for for uh, uh, developing countries and. I think you, you can basically turn the tables there and say that in context of precisely lower you know, flow of investment, foreign direct investment, and uh, lack of legitimacy of current regimes, these windows open up for uh, these countries to introduce these changes and then try to work on what the mechanisms uh, for introducing these changes might be. Right? In, the, in that case, um, Probably the story that you tell about PSD and these private actors um, are, is it would have to basically be joined with some element of Brazilian foreign policy in the longer term, or uh, which might have explained the lack of engagement of Brazil with this, or the lack of proliferation of those treaties before, and why the, the Brazilian state changes um, this policy and in that juncture which again would be a bit in line with the foreign policy analysis article, the, this idea of collusion or, or at least coordination between uh, the, in this case, VSP and the, the, the diplomacy, uh, which seems also a bit underdeveloped in the, in the argument, right? Um, 
so that's that's would be one recommendation maybe for for the next paper where um, you are less idiosyncratic telling less the Brazilian story but more like trying to contribute to a broader international political literature international political economy literature sorry that that would ask how can this state change uh, you know the current regimes in which context and, and through which mechanisms right and then you have an alternate uh, sort of story which is about south south let's say investment and brazil as an investor which uh, i don't know how it would play out here right? so one 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 dimension of this is brazil changing the the, the overall regime um as a subaltern player and then you have this other story which is a bit more hierarchical about and reflects a bit on the kind of agreements that brazil signed in 2015 onwards which is mostly with African countries and Latin American neighbors, which seems more of a um, uh, of, um, kind of south south more or less hierarchical reproduction of the, the previous kind of investment regime, but now with Brazil as the main investor and and trying to promote it, it, its own interests. So in, in this in this different framing, Brazil doesn't come up such, like it's a good uh, like normatively. Um, good uh, actor trying to level the game for others but more um, as a self-interest uh, player um, with so the, the tension i think between these two uh, these two frames uh, is still will still be there and you would have to to think about what's going on in that, in that regard right but definitely i think yeah it's what's a great exploration a very in-depth exploration of of the topic that the the article reflected and i think i, I would encourage you to work for the phd or for, for further publications like think about this more broader theoretical implications so what is what can brazil teach let's say to other countries or well, how can you generalize from the brazilian experience to maybe other developing countries and, and think about that in in that context thanks a lot for the comments i'll consider them in my my next uh, uh, papers. Thank you very much, Luiz. Thank you very much, Lucas. So following our schedule, and just to, to, to make a note, Professor Sean Burgess has had to left, but he was very interested in all your papers, and he asked for all of you to send him the papers, and I think it's a great, great opportunity for you to discuss with him. So moving on, we now will have the presentation of Bruno Binetti from London School of Economics with the presentation Uncomfortable Allies, Brazil and Argentina Relations Since 2003. Please, Bruno, you have the floor. Perfect. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Great. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay, you should be able to see the presentation or not. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Luis, for the invitation. The this is not a paper, at least not yet. Um, but when uh, Luis and I were discussing. Um, the possibility of me presenting here, um, it got me thinking, um, I see Talis saw the map. Um, it's, it got me thinking about what other myths are there in Brazilian foreign policy. And I think the, the strategic alliance with Argentina to a certain extent is one of those myths. Um, and, and I would like to explore that issue with you today. Uh, so following, I think, the, the structure of the paper on the myth of multipolarity, which I think was really, really good, I am trying to analyze structural conditions and domestic conditions that kind of set up the framework of the relationship, a relationship that is, to a certain extent, pretty dysfunctional, at least if we compare it with the expectations both sides, or at least Argentina, had in the early 1990s. But at the same time, a relationship that has been 
pretty resilient, despite, for instance, the eruption of Bolsonaro and the collapse, let's say, of some consensus uh, or of some of the agreements between the two countries. In political terms, sure, the dialogue has completely broken up, but in economic terms, you know, when Bolsonaro won, uh, there were talks about, okay, this, this could be the end of Mercosur, this could be uh, the, the beginning of a Brazil drastically liberalizing its trade and wanting to, to sign its own trade agreements outside of Mercosur, that has not happened. So there's clearly some, there, there are some elements of this relationship that by inertia or by whatever are pretty hard to change, even when there is no convergence between Argentina and, and Brazil. Um, so it's remarkable that compared to other countries and, and to the rest of Latin America, Brazil and Argentina tend to move in tandem when it comes to political alignments, right? Of course, with uh, differences in each country, it's, it's remarkable that with a couple of years uh, gap because of the electoral uh, kind of difference. Um, governments in, in both Argentina and Brazil have tended in the, in the 21st century at least to be of similar uh, ideological orientations. Um, this was of course more present under uh, Lula and especially Lula and Nesta Kirchner. Um, but it continued, let's say, under Temer, Bolsonaro and Macri, and now we're seeing a, a potentially uh, a restoration, let's say, of that convergence should Lula win the upcoming elections. Um, so let's see, to talk about these structural factors and more domestic factors that determine the relationship and, and that somewhat have constrained the relationship to a place where it's very difficult to move it forward, but it's also very difficult to move it backwards. Um, th there is a certain, um, as I said, a certain inertia, a certain, uh, certain constraints that, that despite perhaps changing preferences in, in coalitions in both countries makes it very difficult to, to change. Uh, so one of the first structural conditions that um, determine the nature of the relationship is, of course, the asymmetry. Uh, this is something that sometimes is um, hard to come to terms with in Argentina. Uh, but, you know, if this was already a somewhat asymmetrical relationship in the 1990s, this is even more the case now, despite disappointing economic growth in both countries and, and especially in Brazil, at least compared to its potential, you know, the, the relationship is between not, let's say in comparative terms, France and Germany, this is Germany and the Netherlands, uh, which is important, I think, to, to understand the difficulties of, of the South American integration and of the relationship between Brazil and Argentina in particular. Uh, I was checking out some numbers and, Going back to the European comparison, uh, Germany's GDP is 46% uh, larger than that of France. When we're talking about Brazil and Argentina, Brazil's GDP is 281% uh, larger than the GDP of Argentina. Um, so I think that is something that sometimes in Argentina is still not quite uh, understood. Then, of course, the fact that our economies and especially our exports are increasingly dependent on commodities. Uh, this is not new. This has been going on for at least 20 years. Um, and even though as a total of uh, our external trade, trade between Brazil and Argentina is not very significant, especially in the Brazilian side, but even on the Argentine side, Brazil is not as significant as it, as it used to be as, as a market. Still, it remains highly important because we mostly trade manufactured goods between each other. And that is something that no government from the left or the right is or, or finds it easy to give away. 
Um, there is a reason why under Macri, under Bolsonaro or any government, the uh, long list of exceptions to Mercosur's uh, common tariffs and, and, and theoretically free trade area uh, exists. And that's because we're protecting manufacturers in a context where uh, we don't export a lot of manufacturers to the rest of the world. So preserving that is highly important and it remains highly important, even as at the total of the economic pie, the industrial sector has significantly weakened in both countries. Um, some other constraints are, I think, Brazil's own constraints in defining its role in South America. Brazil is a very large country, of course, it represents 50% of South America's GDP, but at the same time, it's not a rich country, which means that it has severe constraints, economic constraints, and also political constraints when it comes to providing common goods in the region, which is one of the key elements of leadership, right? It's very hard for Brazil, you know, taking, for instance, the structural uh, Convergence Fund of Mercosur. I think Brazil contributes around $50 million every year to that fund, which of course, if, if the goal is to alleviate uh, inequalities among Mercosur members and promote physical integration, it's absolutely ridiculous and, and, and only symbolic. Uh, but you know th that shows the, the constraints uh, Brazil has to really project uh, any sort of leadership in South America and regarding Argentina as well. Um, then I think a very important issue that sometimes is overlooked and, and explains why, even when we had right-wing governments in both countries, the relationship didn't change that much and Mercosur didn't change that much, is that there is no world out there with open, waiting for Mercosur with open arms to sign free trade agreements, to liberalize trade with Mercosur countries. That doesn't exist. Uh, and that brings us back to the discussions about the free trade area of the Americas, which, you know, it might have been Kirchner and Chavez and Evo Morales opposing uh, the, the free trade area of the Americas in a very loud way in, in Mar del Plata in 2005. But the fact is, even the Cardoso administration and then the Lula administration had serious uh, problems with the idea of the FTA uh, of the free trade of the Americas and that had to do with agricultural subsidies that had to do with intellectual property and those were not going back to 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 the discussion we, we were just having this, this was not ideological I mean this was a pure defense of Brazilian uh, economic interest and that happened under Cardoso even though Cardoso was publicly, less perhaps hostile towards the idea of a free trade area of the Americas. It was, I mean, Cardoso would have never signed a deal that liberalized trade in Brazil, but did not take care of non-tariff barriers in the United States. I, I think that would have been a pretty safe bet. Um, and the same thing happens with the Mercosur European Union pre-agreement. Let's say Macri pushed for to have something to show uh, for his efforts, the European Union wanted to, to kind of throw a lifeline at him, but it was clear that Macron and, and Ireland and other European countries had absolutely no intention to, to actually ratify the deal, and that Bolsonaro's abysmal, awful uh, behavior and language in, in environmental terms provided European, these European leaders with a great excuse to uh, block the the deal. But if Bolsonaro is replaced by Lula tomorrow, the problems will not go away, not just on the Brazilian or Argentinian side, but most importantly on the European side. This is an agreement nobody is very convinced of, but it's an agreement that at least uh, unless a, a political earthquake, political and economic earthquake happens in France, we'll never see the light of day. Um, so which explains why even when the right governed Argentina and Brazil, the nature of their relationship remained pretty defensive towards the rest of the world and, and a 
yeah, their ideas were not did not turn into concrete changes to the structure uh, of Mercosur or to the structure of, of economic integration between these countries. Um, going a little bit to, to domestic factors that help understand this kind of intermediate point in the relationship. Um, Brazil, of course, despite Argentina's fantasies, will never agree to compromise or to submit its foreign policy to any negotiation with Argentina. That is a non-starter. Um, Brazil can agree with Argentina on certain regional issues. Brazil could, under Lula, um, allow some Argentinians to, to occupy, like for instance, Kirchner in UNASUR or Dualde in Mercosur, sure. But in, in, in the important issues, Brazil has not been willing uh, and going back to the asymmetry issue I was just talking about, Brazil is not willing to discuss core interests with Argentina. Uh, Brazil defines its core, core interest completely autonomously. It perceives itself as the paper uh, clearly indicates as a global player and there's no way Argentina is going to interfere with that. Um, however, on the side of Argentina, and despite this growing asymmetry, there is no intention in Argentina to bandwagon with Brazil. Uh, that will not happen. It could be for historical um, reasons, ideological reasons, certainly both on the left and the right. Um, Argentina does not see itself as dependent on Brazil for its international or regional uh, insertion. The idea of the strategic alliance with Brazil, of course, is very important, at least rhetorically, for, for especially the Argentinian left. Um, but that doesn't mean that Buenos Aires is willing to just be an appendix of Brazilian foreign policy. Um, which is why under Kirchner, even when allegedly relations between Brazil and Argentina were amazing, and we were brothers, and we were heading in the same direction, et cetera, et cetera, Kirchner always kept, uh, of course, a close relationship with Chavez and even uh, explored, um, not really seriously because nothing came out of it, but explored closer relations with Mexico, even under uh, Felipe Calderón, which was not exactly ideologically aligned with the Kirchner's right. Um, another, I would say, obstacle to in the bilateral relationship uh, has been the fact that Argentina is an uncomfortable neighbor for Brazil and has been for some time. Um, especially under Bolsonaro, I think, Argentina has become, and Peronism in Argentina has become a proxy to attack the PT. Uh, and that means that Lula has to be careful, I think, and the PT in general has to be careful about seeming too close to Kirchnerismo because that may have implications for domestic politics. Um, it's perhaps the Venezuela comparison is too unrealistic. Uh, you know, for, for many, many years, different right-wing parties in Latin America have said, okay, if whoever wins on the left, we will become Venezuela. Perhaps that is getting a little old, but Bolsonaro can still say, if Lula wins, uh, we will end up like Argentina. And, and that has been a very insistent point uh, from Bolsonaro. And I think it, it's something that if we see um, Lula's behavior towards uh, Alberto Fernandez and the Kirchner's in the past few months, he has been, of course, supportive and has accepted their support, but there has been some distance. Um, and I think it has to do with, with this. Um, of course, Argentina is also an uncomfortable neighbor because, you know, if Brazil is stagnating, Argentina is constantly on the verge of exploding. And, and that is not exactly a, a reliable partner. And that also includes what Roberto Russell calls la desmesura uh, of Argentinian foreign policy, which is, you know, that lack of subtlety, that, that, that kind of sudden shifts and very and, and, and very uh, moody 
foreign policy, shall we say, because the lack of credibility of both governments from the left and the right is so strong because of Argentina's own history, I believe left-wing governments tend to exaggerate how left-wing they are in foreign policy and right-wing governments sometimes exaggerate how pro-market they, they are or try to be. And that generates instability and, and, and that I think for some Brazilian elites is uncomfortable and, and it's not what a reliable partner should look like and it, it doesn't make Argentina a trustworthy uh, country. And then of course, it's very hard to have a long-term um relationship and and to chart a new course for uh the bilateral relationship giving the instability political in the case of of brazil economic in the case of both countries uh you know since 2011 even under dilma Rousseff and christina kirchner i believe both countries turned inwards and they had very little to discuss this defensive nature of mercosur became even more pronounced, all the empty institutions that were created, uh, empty because they never actually became operational, I would say, or, or were invested with any sort of authority, such as the president of um, the Commission of Permanent Representatives of Mercosur, which uh, a position that you know, to show its irrelevance, it was occupied by two Argentines on a row, which shows how much of a non-priority it was for Brazil. Uh, first, former President Duarte and then former Vice President Carlos Alvarez. Um, the elected parliament of Mercosur, Parlasur, which has been, uh, which has not had any sort of real authority. Um, the Social Institute of Mercosur, you name it. We've had a lot of, of these uh that that have come to to nothing um and of course the the motto of the lula administration before the kirchners and i think it's the same it would be the same if he returned to power was strategic patience right and, and you know you're not strategic patience uh, to a certain extent i don't think it it, re it it reflects the attitude of lula towards the kirchners that is very different from the solidarity strategic alliance myth uh, both countries um, deployed in the in the early 2000s. Um, as I was saying, under the right, it's not that we had a very clear alternative of what the relationship should look like. I don't think pro-market governments had a clear idea of what they wanted to do with their relationship. I think they had vague ideas about opening up Mercosur to foreign trade. I think those ideas were based on uh, wishful thinking in terms of the, the international context, especially now that protectionism, industrial policy, et cetera, is, uh, is so strong in the global North and the global South. Um, so there is no, there's no alternative project from the right, I believe, and, and that is pretty pretty clear. Uh, both, in a sense, both models of, of integration are exhaustive, both the protectionist political one and the pro-trade, pro-market one. Uh, and, and we are in desperate need, at least in Argentina, for a redefinement of, of the relationship. Um, in the last two minutes, what, might this mean in case Lula wins the elections? Well, it's not going to be easy. Uh, this is not a return to 2003. There's no turning back the clock 20 years. Uh, UNASUR, of course, doesn't exist anymore, which means that the most obvious institutional framework um, for Brazil to have any sort of regional projection would be CELAC. Of course, CELAC is a Mexican creation. And Brazil has, especially the PT, especially Celso Amorim and, and others, have emphasized that Brazil is a South American uh, power, right? Uh, which of course means no Mexico and no Central America, which is where the when where the United States is is most influential in the region. So that will create problems. Not to mention that for the first time. Um, 
Lula will have a potential, even very aloof, but potential competitor for some sort of leadership over the Latin American left, which is Lopez Obrador in Mexico. That has not happened before. Lula in the past and the PT in general enjoyed a sort of monopoly on the on the leadership of the left uh, after particularly with the death of Chavez. And now he will have uh, another potential um, leader of the left in Lopez Obrador. Not that Lopez Obrador is that interested in Latin America. Um, unlike 2003, we also have a very different um, con international global context, uh, polarization and, and rivalry between the United States and China is much more acute than in 2003. It's not as easy to navigate with the, the current international uh, system with initiatives such as the Tehran uh agreement that that's not going to fly i mean with the war in ukraine with sanctions against russia um on the part of the european union and the united states with uh growing animosity with china this is a very different different world in, in which uh playing it solo is going to be much more difficult um we also have regardless um of all of these problems, certain fantasies in Buenos Aires. I don't know if, if you in Brazil are familiar with, with some of these, but one of them is that Argentina hopes to become a member of BRICS. Um, Goldman Sachs did not see that one coming. And then the second delusion, delusion, I would say in the last couple of months, I've been seeing that as Argentina's inflation spirals probably out of control, there has been uh, ideas of, okay, convertibility with the dollar didn't work in the 1990s, it exploded, but what about convertibility with the real? And that is the latest um, idea, at least in some sectors of the Argentine elite, the idea of pegging the, the peso somehow to the real and then hopefully, perhaps, create at some point a common currency, which of course would be a way for Argentina to to tie up its hands, but in, instead of, of depending on the Federal Reserve this time, it would be uh, from the Brazilian Central Bank. Um, an interesting, uh, but this, this idea that Brazil can be a sort of lifeline for Argentina in terms of economic insertion and macroeconomic policy. Um, and then finally, different from 2003, we have a Uruguay, not Paraguay, not so much, uh, that is, getting quite impatient with the, the paralysis of Mercosur. And going back to my point that the, the pro-market right doesn't have a clear alternative is the fact that Bolsonaro, the Bolsonaro administration at first seemed to support Uruguay's attempts to sign trade agreements outside of Mercosur. And now uh, it's completely backtracked and, and it's not supporting that. So, so the inertia, this, this, I, the, the status quo is, uh, is the, the pretty supported at least um, by, by both countries. I think it's, it's pretty clear. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much. And hopefully as I continue working on this, this has nothing, I mean, it's not directly connected to my PhD dissertation. My PhD dissertation is on Chinese, um, participation in the energy sector in Argentina and Brazil and how it's shaped by domestic institutions in both countries and, and how those how different institutions shape different behaviors from Chinese actors in the energy sector. So this is a side thing uh, that I'm just beginning to explore. So I would welcome your your comments and your ideas on this. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. I give the word to Professor Luis. Please, Professor Luis. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Bruno, for a great presentation. Um, so, well, for those of you who do not know Bruno yet, as you can see, he, he is a fantastic political analyst besides the, an academic uh, finishing a PhD who has covered like um, virtually every dimension of the bilateral relationship between re relation between Argentina and Brazil and why these uh, prospects of further integration have not 
become a reality. Um, I would say that perhaps at, at the moment, uh, thinking of uh, developing this as a more academic research, the breadth of knowledge and about detail is is what maybe it's getting in the way of coming up with a with a concrete kind of theoretical argument, right? And and everything that you could leverage for that probably has been laid out in much detail during your presentation and, and paper. Um, but you have a, a, a huge amount of structural and domestic, as you put it, variables, right? That it's not clear how they relate to each other, and 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 in a way, you know, what's the what which is the prominence of one versus the other, and et cetera. I think even I would say you start with a with a major uh, kind of uh, challenge in your research because you're asking for why something does not happen, which is usually not how you would do like empirical research, right? You would look at why why something happened and, and that would be the phenomenon you're exploring and then you're trying to you know, see which, which are the conditions or variables that predict that. But asking in the negative, why, why is this thing not happening? Actually, uh, it's, uh, it's less uh, common to see. So, so I think that the strategy naturally to narrow down to why this is not happening uh, or why, why integration is not happening anymore is to ask what, why did it happen in the past when it happened and which were the factors that were then present that now might be absent, right? And this strategy might uh, both put you more into the, the academic discussion with uh, other scholars and re doing research on, on you know, uh, cooperation, integration, regional, uh, regionalism, call it what you may. Um, and uh, the insights that you're trying to bring forth. Um, in that regard, for example, I uh, Rodrigo Lira, for example, mentioned an article, a previous article of mine, in, again, in foreign policy analysis, where uh, I, I just to bring an example. I proposed that the integration between Argentina and Brazil, which then I, 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 there I identified the bursts of integration first in the in the which I conceptualize a bit as the, you know, the distance between the levels of cooperation between and after, so, so uh, after a certain negotiation, right? Where basically three main uh, uh, young chunkers in the 70s and, and to the 90s, right? One, one is the videla Figueiredo kind of negotiations, which went from almost a war with mobilization border to, uh, it, an in, important level of, of military and economic cooperation in the early 80s. Um, and then the sort of the Alphonsine Sarné, right? This is the usual story. And then the color and, and Menem uh, juncture, right? And what, what I thought, I thought uh, was present in those junctures in this, in this paper I tried to test kind of, is that there was a convergence of some factors that you mentioned, right? That they, throughout all of your narrative. One is this external pressure for liberalization, right? The other one is the kind of concentration of power in the presidents, presidents that could actually also use this power to de-articulate uh, coalitions that might be against integration. Right? And I think what you what your narrative shows is that this the the absence of one or multiple of these factors is uh, uh, might be essential to to explain um, why we didn't see integration throughout the. The period of converging leftist governments, let's say, there you you don't have incentive for liberalization or to de articulate the opposite, opposite kind of domestic industrial coalition, or um, say protectionist coalition, and um, and also the, the the how unlucky we were with the lack of overlap of strong, <laughs> say right wing presidents, you know, or neoliberal presidents that might have pushed this agenda. Um, I don't know, there was not that much of an overlap between Macri and Bolsonaro. If so, Macri was completely depleted in terms of its political, political legitimacy at the very end of its government. Although it's true that even, uh, you know, this, uh, this new factor of the international, lack of international legitimacy of Bolsonaro, which is uh, which was probably very important in sinking the Mercosur uh, EU uh, agreement prospect. Um, but also overall, I mean, clearly we're in the absence of this context of international pressure for, for liberalization, which might have pushed Brazil um, in, in a way um, back in the days, right, when, in the 70s to 90s. 
Something that has changed radically that would be worth exploring is the, the power relation between Argentina and Brazil. So you several times mentioned that Brazil should be this hegemonic actor that pays for the cost of integration in a way or lead, be the leader of, of this process. And it would be if you're going back to that literature where you know other prominent authors like Andres Malamud talks a lot about, in particular, the, the factor of the concentration of power in the president and presidential diplomacy is pushing this foreign his dissertation among others. If you're going to talk to them, maybe you can actually bring this discussion about how this, you know, the factors that might have explained cooperation in that context or integration in that context and um, might not play out now, even if being present, given the new situation of a much more blatant asymmetry between the two countries and um, uh, and other issues like, uh, well, Argentine domestic instability is not kind of new, but I think it's kind of potentially different from what it was then. And um, so, yeah, those are kind of some ideas to to probably expand the next the next version, which would be just to to, to assume that or or accept that you know trying to explain a non-phenomenon might be difficult, and therefore what you are trying to explain is the yeah, you know, it's actually integration, not lack of lack thereof, and 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 shift a bit more towards that direction and. That would be the main picture suggestion. But I would like to leave uh, room for others. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you, Bruno, for the very interesting presentation and for the comments. I will ask for people who want to make any more suggestions or comments to use the chat because we are a little behind the schedule. So I will go further. Last but not least, the presentation of Thales Carvalho from the Federal University of Minas Gerais with the presentation of the Brazilian foreign policy under a far-right leader. Why did Bolsonaro fail to implement a completely new foreign policy in Brazil? And then we will have the comments of Professor Guilherme Casarões and you all feel free to use the chat that I will transmit to the office. Please, Thales, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Pedro. Do you see my screen? Yes, yeah. we all see it. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for being here, listening to me by the time of lunch. So I'm really happy to see you all here. So today I present, uh, my name is Thales Carvalho. I'm a PhD candidate at the S. Professor Pedro said, it, uh, said at the FMG. I, I was also a visiting graduate student at the University of California, San Diego. And today I present this paper, this argument I have been developing with Professor Davidson Lopez uh, and also Vinicius Santos, who is uh, a colleague here from UFMG. I'm just putting my timer here. Okay. So the context of our paper uh, is basically the ascension of several far-right leaders around the world, such as Viktor Orban in Hungary, such as Donald Trump in the United States, such as Donald, uh, such as Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. There's a literature saying that there's, there may be or not a, a, a far right foreign policy in the world. And we aim to, contribute, to, to partly contribute to, to the, this literature and of course, to provide a contribution for understanding the Brazilian foreign policy uh, under Bolsonaro by providing a, a discussion uh, on Bolsonaro's ambiguous foreign policy in Brazil. Uh, to put it uh, to put it summarily, our, our our aim is to answer two questions. First, is Bolsonaro's foreign policy a completely new phenomenon in Brazilian story? And second, what is behind Bolsonaro's foreign policy? In order to answer these two questions, we rely on a public policy theory, uh, specifically the punctuated equilibrium theory. Uh, it is said that Bolsonaro attempted to implement some sharp changes in Brazilian foreign policy. So. Uh, the, the equilibrium, the punctuated, punctuated equilibrium theory becomes handy at, its, at this point because the, punct, the punctuated equ equilibrium theory will say that in order for sharp changes to take place, first, a leader who aims to promote this kind of sharp change will often politicize that, that point because the leader will, will bring a, a totally new point to the to foreign policy. So his supporters will also become part, become part of this process. And exist and, and uh, actors from the current establishment will often try to resist to changes in this kind of policy. And even other actors can come to resist to these uh, foreign policy changes. So uh, sharp shifts will tend 
uh, tend to happen only if leaders win battles in domestic venues and win battles against domestic uh, actors. This is the, the summary of this theory. So how to apply it to Brazil? In the case of Brazil, we are talking about a president, Jair Bolsonaro, who attempted to implement some sharp changes in foreign policy, which I will mention the next time. So there is a huge literature saying that there, there has been an increase in openness in Brazilian foreign policy over the last 20 or maybe 30 years, in which more actors are now part of this process. And Bolsonaro had to win battles against these actors in domestic areas. The Congress, for example, was not so easy regarding Bolsonaro regarding foreign policy. Minister Araújo, for example, was invited to give explanations to the, to the Senate several times and was even fired uh, by some initiative from the uh, um, uh, 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 Senate. So he did not have an easy life with the Brazilian Congress. Even Rodrigo Maia, who was the speaker of the, the, the Chamber of Depu Deputies, also tried to make comments on it. The Supreme Court, although it's not the, the first actor we tend to look at in terms of foreign policy, it had some dispositive plaques. For example, when, uh, when an actor tried to, to, to find some legal framework to fit Brazilian foreign policy, these actors <laughs> uh, relied on the Supreme Court and some decisions uh, were directly or indirectly uh, affected foreign policy. For example, the decision regarding environmental issues or the decision regarding the Venezuelan diplomats during COVID. Federated states and municipalities also have, been, uh, have a role on these policies by, for, uh, for example, uh, uh, Governor uh, Flavio Gino negotiated directly with Chinese actors during COVID and Gover Governor uh, João Doria uh, negotiated with, Chinese, with a Chinese company in order to develop a vaccine for COVID. So this was kind of a bypass on Bolsonaro, just to say. Uh, Itamaraty also has a role, of course. Itamaraty is the, one of the main actors. And it's important to mention that uh, bureaucracies tend to resist change. In the case of Tamagachi, they tend to resist very, very silently, but they tend, tend to resist change. Uh, bureaucracies are not often in favor of huge shifts. So Itamarachi would also act even silently uh, behind doors uh, to block some kind of changes. The armed forces are also played a role in the Bolsonaro as we have one of the most militarized governments in the world today. And also civil society actors, such as interest groups, such as uh, non-governmental organizations and other groups would also complain about Bolsonaro's foreign policy and try to resist to just change these changes. So Bolsonaro would only be able to implement sharp changes in, foreign, in Brazilian foreign policy if he wins battles against all the factors. If not, we, can, we may see some policy continuity or at maximum some incremental changes. But if Bolsonaro wins battles against this, uh, these actors, Bolsonaro would still have to win international battles. Because for example, uh, European, act, um, European states put several hindrances to Brazilian environmental policy under, under Bolsonaro, for example. So a sharp change in foreign policy will only happen if the president is also able to win battles in international, uh, in the, in international context and also get some kind of national support or, or at least not getting hindrances on, international, on, the, on the international stage. So, we use uh, a case study here by relying on some qualitative evidence and also quantitative evidence uh, based on uh, Brazilian voting at the United Nations General Assembly, Brazilian diplomatic personnel, Brazilian voting at the UN Human Rights Council, and to some extent Brazilian main, uh, speeches within, the, within the, the UNJ in order to see if sharp changes took place or not in Brazilian foreign policy. What could we expect Bolsonaro to introduce sharp changes in Brazilian foreign policy? We could expect based on what far-right leaders do, on, based on what Bo, uh, Bolsonaro said he would do, uh, a more, more religious and, uh, a more relig religious and conservative foreign policy, an increased alignment with Trump's US, an anti-communist foreign policy, an anti-globalist foreign policy, a lesser focus on regional integration and the whole global South, and an anti-environmental foreign policy. And before I start, it's just important to mention that when you say when we analyze if Bolsonaro is conducting sharp changes or not in this policy, I'm, not, I'm sure you're not comparing this policy with what was made under uh, uh, Rousseff and Lula. A sharp change foreign policy would be a, a huge change regarding what happened under Temer. So this is very important to say. So what is really new under Bolsonaro, under Bolsonaro's foreign policy? What really changed? We saw indeed a religious, conservative, and pro-Trump foreign policy. As we can see in both plots, the, the, the first plot is about both Brazilian voting similarity with the US 
at the General Assembly. And the second plot is about Brazilian voting at the UN uh, Human Rights Council. Regarding human rights, Brazil really changed its positioning. Brazil started voting less in favor of LGBTQI rights, gender rights, and multi multicultural uh, issues, both in the UN and, the, and, and in the Human Rights Council. Brazil joined other actors such as Poland, such as Hungary, such as Trump, uh, in order to adopt a more conservative agenda and even some Arab um, monarchies, just to, just to mention some examples. Then, as we can see in the plots, Brazil, Brazilian position towards human rights changed in both forums. Second, we could also see a uh, change in position regarding the Palestinian conflict. Brazil started voting more in favor, uh, Brazil, which historically has been in favor of the, the existence of a Palestinian state, started voting completely different uh, and started kind of not being so, uh, so pro a Palestinian state. It was a huge shift in Brazilian foreign policy compared with what happened before. And there were very few hindrances to Brazil in this, in, at, at this point. Maybe one of the few hindrances was that it would be really hard to move the Brazilian embassy in, uh, to, to Jerusalem, as Bolsonaro promised, and hindrances appeared and he was not able to do that. The other things he was able to implement. Then I, I, I brought this plot, which, which is from an, another paper which I, I have been working with Professor Camilo Burian from Mudela, with Professor Davidson Lopez and Professor Jose Antonio Sanau, in which we use data on UNJ speeches and voting in order to classify uh, different governments around the world. And what we can see in this plot is that from, from, from Rousseff to Temer, there was a more conservative policy under Temer, of course, but this was not so different. Rousseff and, uh, and Temer's foreign policy were different, but not a completely huge shift in Brazilian foreign policy. But under Bolsonaro, there was a, more, a, a, a bigger shift. Bolsonaro joined with other leaders such as Trump, Benjamin Netanyahu, Viktor Orban, and Boris Johnson in implementing a more conservative and to some extent nationalistic foreign policy. But Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro's nationalism did not achieve in, in, in full Brazilian foreign policy as we will see in the, in the next slides. These were the only huge shifts brought under Bolsonaro. Because the other points, we saw poli uh, policy continuity or at maximum uh, incremental changes. For example, Bolsonaro was not able to implement a full anti-communist foreign policy. It is true that Bolsonaro moved, uh, that there was moved away from left-wing governments. For example, there are no Cuban, uh, there, there are much less uh, Cuban doctors in Brazil now. Or Brazil adopted a more, a more belligerent rhetoric against Venezuela, for example. That is, that is, it is true. But Brazil was not able to fully move away from China. And even and, and although Bolsonaro tried to do that, although Bolsonaro's sons tried to do that, and although Bolsonaro's uh, 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 personnel tried to do that, it was not able because uh, in every crisis, several actors emerged to contain. For example, the Senate pressed for an Araújo to leave it to quit his job. For example, uh, federated uh, states and municipalities and municipalities try to talk directly with China to, to get some kind of benefits. For example, uh, interest groups were totally against Brazil moving away from China. So Brazil was not able to move away uh, from China. There was a huge resistance uh, domestically and, and of course by the Chinese government to some extent. And as a result, this is not a very anti-communist part, uh, foreign policy. China is still our, our, our key trade partner. Also, to my knowledge, Bolsonaro did not leave the UN. Actually, he's, he's there now. He just made his speech uh, at the UN uh, today. And Brazil is still part of several multilateral institutions around the world. We can see that the diplomatic allocation uh, was kept in several different places. And no big changes regarding the multilateral, uh, regarding multilateral. There was there, there is a deep uh, decreased attention to the region in Brazilian foreign policy, but it started under Temer. It was Temer, for example, who suspended Brazilian participation at UNESCO. Bolsonaro only completed the process, and even the diplomatic allocation, as we can see in this plot, reduced it under Temer. Bolsonaro only kept it, so this was not a huge shift in Brazilian foreign policy. There, is all, uh, there was also a decrease in allocation of diplomatic personnel to Latin American and Caribbean countries themselves, but it also started on the Temer. And, and, and in some cases, under Rousseff, so Bolsonaro only gave continuity to these changes. It was not a sharp change that started under, um, under Bolsonaro. Uh, when we look at other Global South regions, 
there was a continuous press, uh, kind of continuous uh, diplomatic personnel allocation in East Asia, South Asia. There was a decrease in uh, allocation to Middle East and North Africa, but there was a continuity in the number of embassies, so nothing so new at this point. And there was indeed a decrease in allocation to Sub-Saharan Africa and also a decrease in number of embassies. So there was indeed a reducing attention to Sub-Saharan Africa. Regarding other regions, it is, of course, there wasn't this intention at all. Uh, Bolsonaro focused his visit in the United States, so he didn't pay many visits to other regions of, of the world. But it was, not, it was not completely different from what was happening before him. This is the point. So he only, he only increased his lack of attention to global South states. And this is maybe the most controversial point of this presentation, in my opinion, at least, because it was very controversial to me because I really expected to find an anti-environmental foreign policy. And although it is true that there is a huge anti-environmental domestic policy, Brazil is cutting trees every time and burning the forest, but there is no anti-environmental foreign policy. Because although Bolsonaro tried to implement such a policy, he was not able to do that. Bolsonaro didn't leave the Paris Agreement, just to mention an example. But, uh, Brazil was at the conference of part uh, last year and even promised to reduce deforestation and as we can see this plot, also using data from the paper with uh, Camilo Burian, Davidson Lopes, and José Antonio Sarauja, uh, Bolsonaro's position in Taurus, in Taurus environment was not so different from Temer, which was not so different from China. It is true that Brazil is now assuming uh, a, a reduced leadership uh, regarding in, uh, environmental issues. It is also true that Brazil is somehow becoming paria, but it's because of its domestic practices. Because at the UN, Bolsonaro tries to project himself as a protector of the environment. So, a few concluding remarks. First, I'm not saying here that Brazil is not becoming a barrier, but what I'm saying here is that it was not due to sharp changes in foreign policy. Brazilian diplomacy is very bad, and, 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 it's make it, and it makes it harder for Brazil. But we, we did not see a complete reversal in Brazilian foreign policy under Bolsonaro. There were sharp changes towards a more conservative foreign policy, uh, an increased alignment with Trump in the US, but Brazil is still part of most international organizations. Brazil keeps its relations with China, although with some degree of deterioration, but this was an incremental change. This was not a completely change in Brazilian foreign policy. Brazil keeps its distant relations with the region, but it started in September. And the anti-environmentalism did not reach uh, completely rich foreign policy. It's mostly relegated to domestic policy. And just to reaffirm once again, I'm not saying that Brazil has a huge foreign policy under Bolsonaro. I'm just saying that there were not uh, complete changes uh, under Bolsonaro. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and I really look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you very much, Sally. Very nice presentation. Uh, I will pass the word to Professor Guilherme Casarões, and then we'll have a question from Laura in the chat. Please, Professor Guilherme, thank you very much. Alice, thank you so much for this opportunity of making comments on your on your paper. I really like this research. I, I think I know some of the elements of this research. I've seen it before, um, and I, I have really found it uh, enlightening because uh, one of the things that we very often discuss about Bolsonaro's foreign policy is that it was based on a rupture with the past. And I think that what you're trying to prove here is that this rupture was much more on the rhetorical level than on the uh, practical level. And I think that this disjuncture is something that uh, few analyses so far have explored um, and I, 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 my, uh, I myself is to blame because if, 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 you, if you look at what I have published about it, uh, I, I tend to overestimate the, the rhetoric side and not really put focus on what's going on in real life foreign policy, uh, on, on day to day foreign policy. And that's uh, what your data really uh, points to. Now, I have a few comments about the model, and uh, I, I, I'd like to, of course, uh, have more of a dialogue with you rather than just uh, uh, criticizing or making unilateral comments. I, I think that one of the challenges that we have whenever we analyze foreign policy is that the discursive aspect of foreign policy is indissociable from the practical 
aspect of foreign policy. So even though you, I think you have a very strong point to claim that Bolsonaro was much more uh, bark than bite, let's put it this way, I, I still think that many of his rhetorical or discursive elements have uh, disrupted the logic of Brazil's foreign policy in many respects. So for example, uh, I see an unprecedented degree of diplomatic isolation of the Bolsonaro administration. This is very hard to measure. I think that this might have to do with something that Davidson uh, showed us earlier this morning. I mean, the map and the travels and the itinerary. But I think that we, we might try to come up with different indicators to uh, evaluate the degree of isolation of Bolsonaro from a diplomatic point of view. We know that from an economic standpoint, for example, uh, Brazil is not isolated because after all, Brazil is Brazil irrespective of the president. But at the same time, I, I really feel uh, it just will take me a little bit more of empirical effort, but I really feel that Bolsonaro is the, the single most isolated president in the history of Brazilian diplomacy in terms of uh, how his government is not able to deal with other partners on a high level uh, on, on a high level uh, sort of meeting or, or, or strategy, right? Because, uh, for example, I, I understand your point uh, when you say that um, anti-communism uh, was much more towards uh, Latin American countries like Ni uh, Nicaragua or Venezuela, but not really towards China. And I agree with that. But at the same time, uh, how much did we progress? How much did we advance? in a bilateral agenda, in a high level strategic bilateral agenda with China over the last four years. You see, because we're talking about the most important uh, period of Chinese rise to power, uh, nothing that China does right now compares to what China used to do like 10 years ago. And yet under Lula and Rousseff, uh, Brazil was trying to engage much more substantially with China on some multilateral and bilateral efforts. And this is not something that we saw uh, under Bolsonaro, at least not as much. I've, I've read the documents, I've seen the declarations, I don't really see um, uh, much of an adv advance. The same goes, for example, for uh, the United States. It's obvious that Brazil will always have a state-driven uh, state foreign policy towards uh, the United States, that's obvious. But how much does the personal relationship between two presidents affect the strategic place, uh, usually the weaker country occupies in the concerns of the, 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 the bigger country? And this is, this is something that we have kind of lost uh, during the Bolsonaro-Biden period from 2021 until today. So I, I think that uh, uh, your argument is very much in place. I agree with it. I think that uh, in practice, there's not much of a change in Bolsonaro's foreign policy. At least on the surface, Brazil is still around, even in multilateral fora, for example. But I think it deserves some extra nuance. And I think that the nuance would be, for example, to assess to what extent has Bolsonaro's foreign policy changed in terms of its approach to some multilateral issues? Okay, you're saying that uh, there was no anti-environmental foreign policy, but is his pro-environment foreign policy in the same quality and nature of the foreign policy that Brazil has advanced in previous governments. Uh, we do have a foreign policy for human rights and we decided not, not, not only not to abandon the Human Rights Council, but also to get reelected in the Human Rights Council. And yet, is Brazil's foreign policy for human rights in the same quality and nature of the one that we saw in the preceding governments, even under President Temer? So I, I think that these, these nuances should be uh, 
in place. I mean, you should make some uh, caveats along the way, like adding footnotes and saying, okay, uh, I understand that uh, multilateralism is still there, but the nature or the content or the substance of multilateralism has changed. Likewise, um, I understand that the relationship with China is still there, but maybe below the surface, you have a different kind of foreign policy or foreign relationship with China or the United States or Argentina, which the, the raw data does not reveal. Um, I think that one of the main findings of your, of your discussion has to do with uh, the role of South America and Latin America in Brazil's foreign policy, because as you've pointed out, the major changes, the concrete changes that we've seen in foreign policy, um, in, in Bolsonaro's foreign policy, have more to do with the region than any other part of the world, right? At least that's your, just a second. At least that's your suggestion, right? Uh, when you speak, for example, of anti-communism, or when you, when you talk about some integration aspects of Brazil's foreign policy, the focus of the discussion is much more uh, around South America or Latin America than any other region of the world. So I, I think that some distinctions should be made. The first distinction is, uh, does Bolsonaro deal any differently with regional issues and global issues? And when it comes to global issues, do we feel any difference between the relationship between Brazil and great powers, being Brazil the weakest link, and smaller countries uh, where Brazil is the dominant power or the, the, the strongest part. Do we see any change of nature in multilateralism? Do we see any different efforts uh, budget-wise or politically-wise to regional integration efforts, for example? So, even though I agree, I fundamentally agree with your arguments, I really think that it deserves some nuance here and there, especially when it comes to uh, this very uncomfortable overlapping between rhetoric and practice. Because in diplomacy, as we learn from, from the first class of uh, international relations or foreign policy analysis, diplomacy is both about practice and rhetoric. So there, there have been some disruptive changes on the way Bolsonaro has framed international problems. And these changes, they might have affected below the superficial evaluation of the raw figures. So the data is correct, and the way you analyze it is fundamentally true. But I think that that must be something underneath this uh, apparent, apparent continuity that deserves some greater evaluation. Uh, from a methodological point of view, this is challenging because uh, that will force you to go towards a mixed methods approach. Maybe looking at the figures as you've done, but also trying to look at specific cases where this change wasn't really, uh, wasn't really, uh, if, if you wanna really prove your hypothesis that nothing has changed, uh, in, in the bigger picture of things, maybe you should select some cases to really prove that even underneath the sheets, uh, things haven't really changed uh, also. It's complicated. I understand that, that there is an obstacle there, but I really feel that only by showing the raw numbers, uh, you, you fall short of telling a part of the story that is important which is pretty much how other countries reacted to what Bolsonaro has said and done and how it changed the nature and the quality of foreign policy towards these countries or some bigger issues such as human rights or the environment. But I'd love to hear from you. I mean, what, what, what you thought about it because I really appreciate your efforts and your research. Thank you very much, Professor Guilherme. Very nice comments. We have before, I reach the word to Thales. We have a question from Laura. Uh, Guilherme, can we open the microphone? Not you, Casarans, I'm sorry. 
to Laura. Okay, so Laura, can you ask the questions on the microphone, please? Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Let me just get my camera so you see me as well. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to hear uh, you and to see some very good faces. Um, actually, I had two questions. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to be super brief. You can just read it if you want. The first one was um, was related to the domestic and international nexus that Kazarins was mentioning before. So I was just wondering whether would you feel that it's important in your model, and particularly in that particular first figure you had, you know, the domestic actors that you think Bolsonaro has to win over. So my question is, why in terms of the domestic actors, the state actors, you only included uh, Itamarachi and not included particular bureaucracies that would eventually, you know, make your, I mean, for, for some, for maybe for some policy areas like voting at the UN, it might be less of, of an importance, but in other issue areas, I'm, I'm pretty sure that all the domestic actors could be interesting for you to include in a model. So that was a kind of a question suggestion here. And the second one is, is probably related to what Kazarin just said. Um, it's just a suggestion if you want to go into or bring in other kinds of literature, such as policy dismantling, which will lead you to a mixed method kind of an analysis, I'm afraid. But, but I guess you, you, you can kind of use existing literature to understand, to reconceive or to put some nuance on how do you conceive change and policy change beyond particular metrics, right? So it's just a suggestion here that, for instance, policy uh, dismantling literature could be interesting for you in terms of getting the nuances between um, actually unpacking the black box of what radical change means and the different ways in which um, governments can actually change something, right, through different um, instruments. But anyway, so just suggestions and very congratulations to your, um, to your research. Thank you very much, Laura. Very interesting comments as well. Please, Talis, if you can be very briefly and we can finish our seminar just 15 minutes late, which in these lands are very acceptable. So please, Talis, you have the floor. Great, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Casagones. Thank you very much, Laura, for your comments. I will try to be as quick as possible. I, I really would like to answer all the comments, but I'll try to, to be as quick as possible here. Uh, well, these were very interesting comments. So it's very, I, I, I would need more time to reflect, reflect on it and to give answers on it. And some comments I can't even answer because I just need to reflect and think what to do with them. But I would just uh, put, uh, put my attention, in, uh, uh, draw the attention to two particular points. First, uh, from an impression that came to me while hearing, hearing the comments and while presenting was that most of Bolsonaro's problems regarding isolation and something like that, these problems tend to come from how Bolsonaro does foreign policy, but not, not necessarily from the foreign policy itself. And even uh, and as, as you uh, draw, draw attention, Professor Casagones, regarding the difference between rhetoric and practice, in some cases, for example, environmental politics, uh, Bolsonaro's rhetoric is try is also pro environmental protection mark because he tried to project himself as a protector. He he doesn't want to to buy a, a shock against other states. So sometimes the rhetoric is not so different from practice. And even uh, in, in the case of human rights, where there was a clear shift, in this case, the, the rhetoric is is clearly conservative, but the rhetoric. It, is together with the practice, so it follows. But my guess regarding all your comments is that maybe the, the biggest problem uh, that made Brazil more isolated comes from how, par, how foreign policy uh, is implemented, but not what foreign policy is implemented. But I'm just like putting in here a hypothesis I, I, I thought during the presentation. I cannot uh, test it now and say more things about it now. Regarding your, your, other, your other comments, I will, of course, uh, consider them uh, while finishing the paper. And uh, regarding Laura's comments, I also thank you very much. I confess I didn't know about this literature on, uh, about a little, a, a little to be mentioned here, so I'll, I'll take a look at it. And we, we tried to include different actors in our analysis. We just did not include more bureaucracies in our view, too. Maybe we should do that. 
but we, we, we looked at several actors. Here, I just mentioned some of them uh, while, while mentioning uh, policy changes, but we, uh, we contemplate, for example, the role of some civil society actors, uh, parliamentary fronts, uh, and other groups of interest in, other, in, in our analysis. Uh, the armamentist lobby, for example, it's part of our analysis and other groups. But I thank you very much, and I really think we, we can look at other bureaucracies uh, in the future. If I had more time, I would. I, I, I really would like to learn some more of you, but maybe we can continue this conversation through other means. And I thank you very much for the comments. We thank will, Fernando. In you, Portuguese, Fernando. which is easier for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I, I suggest you to exchange contacts because there were indeed very interesting comments and unfortunately we don't have enough time to discuss further but the idea here is to put people connected to present those very interesting researchers to have such a interesting and very high level specialists like professor davis Dave davison professor luis Stenoni, professor guilherme casaroni and thank you very much for for being here. I would like to thank again the graduate program of international relations at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Guilherme from the, the service and Professor Maria Antonieta del Tedesco Lins for all the support. And thank you all again. I'm sorry about the 15 minutes delay, but I think we could manage a great discussion. I'm sorry for Bruno, Rodrigo, and Lucas that we could not. Uh, further uh, to have more and more time for discussion, but I think we have good comments, very excellent comments, and I enjoy it a lot. Thank you very much for the presence, and we will see you on the next seminar of the the program uh, to be scheduled and to be uh, presented for you. Thank you very much, and I hope we will see in short. Bye to you all.